when the Buddha lists the qualities that set the mind on fire, the list is passion, aversion, delusion. When he lists the qualities that are the basis for unskillful mind states, he has a different list, similar but not quite the same. Greed, anger, and delusion. The big difference there is between the greed and the passion. Because not all passion is unskillful. After all, you can have a passion for the path. In fact, you have to have a passion for the path in order to practice. The passion covers, in addition to the passion of the path, the unskillful types, of course, are passion for sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, which you might call greed for experiences. And the word greed is used to come for greed, more greed for things. Now, the Buddha didn't say that wanting to have things in and of itself is bad. When he talks about unskillful greed, it's there's a particular term, it's visama lopa. Visama means out of balance, out of line with the way things should be. And as John Suat often liked to say, the Buddha didn't say that the desire to have things was bad. One of the qualities the Buddha lists as the causes for happiness in this life is industriousness. In other words, working hard to gain your wealth. And the second quality is learning how to maintain and protect the wealth you've gained. The third is learning how to spend it in a way that's appropriate. It's interesting that Buddha, of course, says you don't want to be wasteful in your spending, but at the same time you don't want to be miserly. This is one of the rewards of having material things, he said, is learning how to have some pleasure out of them. And the reason seems to be that if you can't take pleasure out of your material things, then you're not going to look with a favorable eye on the pleasures that other people have. And it's going to be impossible to develop the quality of empathetic joy. Sometimes it would be hard to develop a quality of compassion. You don't care about it. You don't care for pleasures. You don't see other people's pleasure or happiness as being valuable. And then the fourth quality for happiness in this lifetime, the Buddha said, is having admirable friends. People who have conviction in the principle of karma, people who are generous, people who are virtuous, people who are wise. And not only just having these people as your friends, but also trying to emulate them. Because they remind you that there's more to life than just getting and gaining wealth and spending things. You want to look at what your wealth can do. There's a lot of good that can be done with wealth. Look at Ananda Bindiga, who provided the Buddha with the, the monastery that he lived in for apparently at least 20 years. And the forest Johns pointed out how much wealth can be used to develop good qualities of the character, particularly the perfections, the perfection of generosity, the perfection of goodwill, showing your goodwill for others, being generous. In other words, getting some good out of your wealth. And John Lee talks about material things like being a fruit. And then you squeeze the goodness out of them, in other words, by being generous or by using them to help other people. And that actually, the actual the generosity, the quality you develop in the mind, that's the juice of the fruit. And the rind is the things. Because after all, things come and they go. And if your happiness is based on simply how much you can gain, it's going to be happiness is divisive, because there's so many ways in which people gain and somebody else has to lose. Whereas if your industriousness is paired with generosity, then you gain, but then people gain back. I don't believe 
made it a better trade. You've transmuted it into something good. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. We just simply have to realize that the wealth in and of itself is not an end. It's a means. And the simple pleasure of enjoying the wealth shouldn't be your end either. You should think there's greater good that can be done with it. So as we work on developing the mind here, we're trying to pull back from the unskillful side of these qualities of passion, aversion, and delusion, or greed, anger, and delusion, to give the mind a place where it can stay and look at these things, look at these qualities from a more objective standpoint. Because so much of our greed, so much of our passion is basically a hunger. And you know what happens to people when they let their hungers take over? The purpose of the meditation is to give you some satisfaction, to find a way to find some well-being simply by breathing in a comfortable way, learning to develop skillful qualities in the mind, abandon unskillful qualities, and have a sense of how much lighter the mind feels when it's trained, how much better it feels. And then you can look back at the qualities of greed, aversion, and delusion and realize that that's not where you want to go. That's not where you want to find your happiness. The meditation gives you something better. So it's in this way that the meditation is a gift to other people. You're less hungry for things outside. It means that you're going to be less in conflict. And you're going to learn how to manage your wealth a lot better this way. You begin to see the drawbacks of wealth. I've known some very wealthy people who never really trust anybody else. And there's always that concern that these other people who come and see them, are they there for the money, or are they there for something, or what? The same as when you have a lot of power. People come thronging around, well, you wonder why are they there, what share do they want out of your power? And of course the fact that people can be jealous. Whereas if you're treasures, and this is where the Buddha takes the analogy of wealth and brings it inside, he says that there are treasures of the mind. If your treasures are inside, they're yours for sure. Nobody can, has to be jealous of them, and there's no way you can be afraid that they're going to take them away from you. And that kind of investment is a lot safer. So in this way you take that quality of industriousness that's used for getting wealth outside, and you learn how to bring it inside, create wealth inside. Conviction is a form of inner wealth. A healthy sense of shame and compunction. Those are both forms of inner wealth. Shame here is not the opposite of pride, it's the opposite of shamelessness. When you realize that certain types of behavior are beneath you, you wouldn't stoop to them. That's a wealth, form of wealth. Compunction is when you realize that your actions have consequences, and you want to make sure that you don't do anything that will lead to anything unskillful, anything, any harm to anybody. And these are the qualities that underlie virtue, which is the fourth treasure. And these four create a set, con conviction, shame, compunction, virtue. They protect you from doing things that you, are, you would later regret. And that's something really valuable. Years back I heard a radio broadcast where a veteran from Vietnam was talking about how he had very casually killed a young Vietnamese girl one time. No reason at all. And it's haunted him ever since. And he said on the broadcast, if he had a million dollars that he could go back and undo that deed, he'd gladly pay that amount of money. Well, there's no amount of money that can go back and undo things you've done. But if you have the shame and the compunction and the virtue, 
on the conviction that would prevent you from doing those things to begin with. It shows that they're worth more than any amount of money. The other treasures are learning, in other words, learning about the Dharma, having a fund of knowing what the Buddha said on different topics, so you can call them to mind when you need them. Generosity and then discernment. I notice that some of these treasures are qualities of that admirable friend you're looking for. Because that admirable friendship leads beyond just well-being in this lifetime, and into developing the treasures that will take you on, that look after you, and that provide for you in future lifetimes as well. These are things that you don't leave behind. They go with you. So as far as material pleasures are concerned, the Buddha says a certain amount of industriousness and a certain amount of desire is okay. But you have to be very careful about how you go about gaining your wealth and spending it. But with noble treasures, the more the better, the more you can develop in this area, the better it will be for you and for the people around you. And that's not called greed, trying to develop these treasures. It's called heedfulness. Which lies at the basis of all skillful qualities. So external wealth is something that is necessary for life. And if you gain it in the proper way, then there's nothing wrong with it. If you use it in a way to develop good qualities of the mind, that's a good investment. The Buddha actually uses these analogies of investment. Thinking in material terms. Sometimes we're told that spiritual materialism is a bad thing. That we shouldn't be trying to gain anything out of the meditation. Well, if we're not thinking of gaining anything out of the meditation, what are we doing here? Everything we do has a purpose. And so you want to make sure that your purposes are for your long-term welfare and happiness. Material wealth can't guarantee that. Inner wealth can. So want as much internal wealth as you want. As long as you act wisely on that desire, you're going to be fine. 